hur blev det som det blev i våra hem och våra stadsrum? När det moderna samhället började byggas för ungefär hundra år sedan så var ljudet centralt för stadsplanerarna. Ljudet var centralt för hur man ville att städerna skulle ta form. Men utgick stadsplanerarna från allas syn på ljud? Inte riktigt. Och det här ska vi nu få höra mer om med vår första gäst från England. Please welcome James Mansell from University of Nottingham. Hello, it's a real pleasure to be here in uh, the lovely city of Lund. I've seen some snow, so I'm very happy to have uh, uh, entered w winter. Um, it's lovely to be here in this wonderful hall. Um, so, I'm going to talk uh, today about home, starting off this session on home and city. Um, I'm going to talk about the way in which home has been experienced and managed as a sensory environment. I'm going to deal particularly with home as a sonic territory, as it was experienced and reshaped over the course of the early 20th century. I'm a historian. My research is mainly uh, about how we might understand sound as a historical category, how as historians we might go about recovering past sonic experiences. So I'm drawing material in this talk from a book that I've been working on about the history of noise in early 20th century Britain. So I'm going to argue that by taking an historical approach, we can better appreciate the ways in which hearing and listening are not only scientifically quantifiable acts, but also formed in culture, reflective of historically contingent ideas and ideologies, indexing social difference, drawing us from our position as isolated individuals into relations with one another, for better or for worse, in the spaces we inhabit, in the home and in the city. So although my case studies are going to be from Britain in the 1930s and 1940s mainly, I hope to show and to argue that the approach that I take in the talk, uh, decoding the cultural meanings of sound as they operated at that time, can have wider application and significance for how we deal with questions of home acoustics today. So I want to begin with a concept of modernity. Um, this poster you can see in the background here was uh, made in Britain in 1935. Uh, it's the logo of Britain's Anti-Noise League. The Anti-Noise League was formed in 1934. It existed until the early 1950s when it was replaced by a noise abatement society. And that noise abatement society still exists in London today uh, and operates uh, along very much the same lines. So the 10 years between around 1928 and 1938 were key years in the development of an organized uh, noise abatement campaign right across Europe and North America, not just in Britain, I'm sure in Sweden too. If you're interested in this, there's an excellent book by uh, an author called Karin Beistevelt, which is called Mechanical Sounds, and traces the history of noise abatement right across Europe. The Anti-Noise League in Britain set out to convince the public and government that modern urban noise, in particular that caused by motor traffic and new forms of sound technology, such as the gramophone and the wireless, was a public health hazard. The health argument was very much to the fore. And they argued that the irregular vibrations caused by noise made the body's nervous system also vibrate irregularly, leading, they thought, in the end to nervous breakdown. So their argument was that noise enters the body, it causes the nerves to vibrate in unhealthy ways, ultimately passing through to the brain and causing psychological and psychiatric uh, breakdown, sometimes in quite serious ways. So in 1935, the Anti-Noise League staged a major exhibition at the Science Museum in, in, in London. If you've been to it, it's one of the, the major uh, national museums in the UK. Um, you can see here a photograph from one of the exhibition stands. This is the stand that promoted the Anti-Noise League as an organization. And this is very much uh, targeted at convincing the exhibition goers that noise was a public health problem. Apart from all the other things that noise might do, uh, noise causes us to become ill. So you can see in the middle there's a mock thermometer 
I know that the image quality is not so great, but what you see on either side there is increasingly loud noises. Towards the top is something like a pneumatic drill. Uh, towards the bottom, quiet singing or playing the piano. And the argument is that the louder the sound gets, um, the more intense the penetration of the body's nervous system, the, the, the greater the health risks. And there's two posters either side there. The one on the, the right is particularly interesting. It says, quiet brings comfort, health, and efficiency. This is the message we wanted to take out uh, to ordinary British people in 1935. The wider logic of the anti-noise campaign was simply that modernity had gone too far, to sum it up. Technological progress had gone beyond the human body's capacity to absorb it. This is the essence of the argument put forward by noise abatement campaigners. So what matters here, I think, is that this anti-modern attitude, it's an anti-technology attitude, um, because it was promoted by the Anti-Noise anti League and became uh, a cause celebre for, for very well-known writers like H.G. Wells and Aldous Huxley, two very well-known British writers who were both involved in the anti-noise campaign. Because of that, I want to argue that this anti-modern way of hearing urban sound became a significant way of hearing, a significant culture in which um, everyday sound was understood, heard, and made sense of in Britain at this time. So in the 1930s, the meaning of mechanical sound was profoundly bound up with a deep sense of malaise about technological progress, targeted not only at the rise of technologies like the motor car, for example, but also at the memory of the sounds of the First World War. The exhibition also featured a wide range of new quiet technologies. What you can see at the top there is uh, a, a new quiet or silent typewriter. It promises to be a silent typewriter. I'm not sure they ever qu quite managed to um, affect exactly a, a silent typewriter. And at the bottom, um, domestic technologies, there were a number of other ones, but this is the Electrolux home cleaning system, which promised to be altogether quieter than the Hoover. The wider exhibition, in fact, included two full replica houses. They built two houses within the Science Museum, one using traditional building techniques, those building techniques uh, traditionally used by Victorian builders, and one using a whole series of new soundproofing techniques. And they filled the second house with all of these new technologies, quieter technologies, quieter cleaning equipment, and so on. They wanted to demonstrate um, what it would be like if only we could live in a, in a properly soundproofed building with properly uh, designed quiet technology. This is the final photograph I'm going to show you of this exhibition, just to illustrate the importance of the emphasis that was placed on building good homes. This is a, a whole building section of the exhibition. What you see there are audiometers and other noise measuring equipment which were taken out by various agencies to measure noise levels in British homes. So, what I want to argue is that the emphasis of the Anti-Noise League through this exhibition was very much on the cause of the modern noise problem. And they, they specified this as technology. New technological innovation was a problem, but it was also a potential cure. The emphasis is very much on technology is causing the problem, motor traffic, gramophones, typewriters, hoovers, and so on. But also, through new innovations in design and science and technology, man can potentially solve this series of problems. But I want to emphasize that this, this, this very particular focus on technology as both problem and solution needn't necessarily have been the approach taken. And I will argue towards the end of the talk that this focus on technology rather than, for example, community or social organization led to problems between the designers of uh, sonic spaces and the users of sonic spaces in the home. The emphasis on the sonic properties of home was important in this exhibition because it sat within a wider set of issues operating in British society at this time. So like many other European countries at this, at this point in history, Britain was in the, uh, in the grip of a housing crisis caused by the First World War and other factors. Local and national governments were setting in motion major new home building projects. Uh, and thanks to the lobbying of the Anti-Noise League, acoustics became a major concern of good planning and architecture over this period between the 1930s and 1940s. Central government asked uh, two organizations, they set up two 
specific organizations who are tasked in part with dealing with this question. One was called the National Physical Laboratory, which still exists, and one was called the Building Research Station, which still exists as the Building Research Establishment in London, to investigate ways of planning the home so that the home dweller would be protected from the noise of the city. Psychologists, for example, F.C. Bartlett, argued that providing quiet at home should be among the key responsibilities of government planning authorities. Here's a quote. He said, sound, like love, laughs at locksmith and has a most disconcerting habit of finding its way through or across all manner of defenses. The end of his quote. I particularly like this way of describing what sound is and what sound does as a different kind of force to the physical space of the home, the physical four walls. Sound isn't, doesn't follow the same logic. So he deftly, he deftly conflated physical and psychological space in his description, implying that noise's intrusion on the privacy of the home intensified its attack on the private interiority of the mind. He's a psychologist, remember. He thought of the home environment and its soundscape as being inextricably linked to the maintenance of psychological health. He referred to many case studies, uh, including, to quote him, an old lady, desperately poor, unbendingly independent, whose mental fortitude, he said, in the face of poverty, was severely tested by the sound of next door's gramophone loudspeaker. So next door was playing a gramophone, and it was coming through into her house. So here, sound had the potential, uh, according to Bartlett, to extend the psychological strains of social life, poverty and so on, into the individual privacy of the home, where you might hope to be separate from all of those challenges. He argued, this is Bartlett again, the builder, the buildings, constructor, and the architect should urgently do all that they can to protect the nation's psychological well-being. So it became a priority in the 1930s and 1940s that architects and home builders should think about the conditions that exist at home um, in terms of sound. And the British government duly employed the best acousticians to work on this question of how to make the home a good sonic environment at this time. Uh, there's an acoustician called Hope Bagenal, who was the most famous of these, and he argued that in the rush to create new homes in the 1920s after the First World War, developers were using cheaper and acoustically worse materials than in the Victorian age. So there was a, a, a huge need for new homes in the 1920s and 1930s. And the argument from government scientists is that the private home, home developers are, are making poorer quality homes than had ever been the case even in the Victorian period. And he said there's a terrible irony in this situation of building these poor quality homes. He said, this is the direct quote from him, the noise of the motor bus, the jazz band, the lift motor gate and the loudspeaker have invaded the home. So the architect and the builder at this point, building poor quality homes, had left the inhabitants, and this is his quote, naked to noise. So Hope Bagenal argued that not only was the world outside the home a noisier place, but the modern home was also now filled from the inside by sounds emanating from all manner of new domestic technologies. To quote him again, the force pump of the heating system, the electric transformer, the ventilating fan, the refrigerator, the vacuum cleaner, he said, they all contribute their various screams, hums, and tappings. So for, for, him, for his point of view, it was important that planners, architects, acousticians should now be putting more emphasis, uh, more importance on questions to do with home acoustics, home planning from the point of view of sound. And indeed, acoustics became almost a new obsession in British home planning, uh, in British home planning and architecture in this, in this period. This image so it shows the extent to which even the Royal Institute of British Architects appreciated the need to take sound seriously. You might recognize the building at the top there, that's the headquarters of REBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects in London. And this image um, is, a, is a diagram showing uh, the headquarters from the point of view of its excellent soundproofing. So the noise emanating from three motor vehicles at the bottom of the diagram is rendered powerless by the modernist design of the building. None of its windows face the road, its brain, right at the top of the building where that line points, is the council chamber where the important meetings would happen. That top floor council chamber is shown to repel the weak sound waves of the motor traffic by virtue of uh, its lofty position and reinforced walls. The argument is really that planning for acoustics is simple if only uh, architects, home planners will take this problem seriously. And government researchers, they did take it seriously. They began to examine sound insulating properties of various different types of walls and floors. 
Uh, ideal materials for sound insulation were recommended, as were ideal thicknesses for partitions, walls, windows. So the government sciences working in the National Physical Laboratory and the building research station were producing all sorts of recommendations for private home builders about how this should ideally take place. The innovation which they were most proud of at this particular moment in history was what they called the floating floor. This was specifically for flats and involved creating a concrete floor insulated from below, from the structural floor below it, um, and from the walls around it by rubber or felt pads. So the floor is effectively isolated by sound absorbing technology. This is particularly important for flats um, because of the, the way in which sound is communicated between uh, floors and ceilings. In addition to new structural innovations, acoustic planners working at the building research station and the National Physical Laboratory recommended new ways of arranging rooms within houses and flats. A picture to show you here. This is just one example among many. Um, in this diagram, for example, details uh, the attempt to lessen the auditory intrusion of the indoor toilet system. So uh, if you think about it, in the 1920s and 1930s, the indoor toilet is relatively new, at least for uh, people more used to living in Victorian back-to-back -back slum houses. So when you're rehousing people from traditional dilapidated Victorian housing, where the toilet is likely to be outside, and they move into new semi-detached houses or possibly even flats, uh, surveys showed, in fact, that the, the noise that they most disliked, the noise that was most disturbing to them, was the noise of the toilet flushing. Uh, at night, perhaps, or during the evening, when the technology of the toilet was relatively new and relatively undeveloped and created a, a horrible clashing noise. So this was an attempt by planners to replan the house on the basis of trying to avoid uh, overlap between the flushing of the toilet sound and the uh, important functions of the bedroom for sleeping and the living room for leisure. Uh, so these, this particular diagram, um, in the example A, example A, the bathrooms have been planned against bedrooms and above the living room, so that's bad. Example A is n how not to do it. Um, example A leads, according to the authors of the report that, that was published with this, to unnecessary disturbance of leisure and sleep when the toilet's flushed. But in example B, uh, you see ways of avoiding this problem essentially by planning bathrooms away from bedrooms and living rooms. In semi-detached houses and flats, it was also recommended that living rooms should be planned so that they adjoined the neighboring living room uh, and the same with the bedrooms, so your bedroom would be against the next door's bedroom, so that the auditory rhythms of daily life would be synchronized from one dwelling to the next. All of these things are really very simple. They don't involve major technological innovation, but simply th the point is that they're being brought to the designer and planner's attention at this stage as a way of overcoming some quite serious problems as they saw it to do with noise. So concerns about noise, I would say, had a significant impact on, a ho on how home interiors were planned, at least in theory, um, from the 1930s onwards. Uh, they also contributed to the development of new building designs, um, especially for blocks of flats, which is a key concern. So this is a, another diagram. Uh, the diagram shows two designs for blocks of flats. Um, residents of example A, again, example A is the bad way of designing flats, according to these, re these reports. Um, in example A, you're exposed to the full force of traffic on one side and on the other from the internal courtyard to the sounds of milk delivery, refuse collection, and neighbors' loudspeakers. Actually, milk delivery is the other big complaint of this period. The milk is delivered in big metal containers, and so when it comes at four in the morning, everyone's woken up. So toilets and uh, milk delivery, interestingly, are the two, two big complaints for home dwellers. So example A is bad because you get the noise from the road and the noise from your neighbors uh, in the courtyard. Uh, example B avoids these problems simply by removing the courtyard and setting the windows back from the street. So you, you gain from having some, some space between the street and, and the windows for the apartments. Again, very simple, but just shows you the way in which new ways of thinking about sound in this period were shaping uh, approaches to both the internal and the external design of buildings. The key problem which remained for planners was that they knew that in order to solve the housing crisis, this massive shortage of housing that was affecting Britain in the 1930s, they would have to convince large numbers of people to move not into houses, but in fact into flats, uh, apartments in Britain we call them flats. Um, as a key issue, if you want to rehouse very large numbers of people, you need to get them into apartment blocks because of the higher density. 
But the problem was that working class people had been shown by a number of studies generally were reluctant to live in flats. They were used to living in terraced houses and they, they thought of uh, apartments as being an undesirable way to live. And in fact, a whole host of studies done at the time showed that the key concern, the key complaint of working class people when they were asked whether they would be willing to move into a flat was that they said, flats are too noisy. Flats and apartments are noisier than houses. It's very interesting considering that largely they're being rehoused from what would have been described as slum areas, which you might think would be noisy enough. But it's interesting that they say, that no, the flat is going to be too noisy. Um, so to overcome these problems, uh, a whole host of promotional activities were undertaken. Uh, posters, films, through so on. So uh, the uh, poster on the left, for example, was made during the Second World War. In it, you can see run-down Victorian terraced houses and wonderful new flats. Uh, it's a war poster. Your Britain fight for it now. So what you're fighting for in the Second World War is the opportunity to live in properly planned, well-designed well flats, apartments, rather than houses. And in the second image there, this is a, a still from a fil film called Housing Problems. Again, there's a contrast between poor quality Victorian housing versus the planned, rational, modern apartment block. You see that by the, the way in which the two things are contrasted. And the voiceover makes it very clear that the apartment is uh, the future for um, good housing. But the key problem still remains, that not only from the point of view of the dweller is the house uh, seem to be quieter than the flat, and the flat seem to be noisier, but also from an engineering and structural point of view, uh, there is a problem about creating good acoustics in flats. So in order to establish exactly what they could do to convince working class people to live in apartments, government planners also undertook a number of surveys with ordinary people about their attitudes to sound at home. And it's these surveys, I think, that provide us with perhaps the most interesting insights, uh, certainly the amount of insights that I can cram into a talk today. So the social survey organization Mass Observation was contracted to conduct surveys about home. Its findings showed that quietness was indeed an important concern for home dwellers. This quote from one of Mass Observation's respondents was found to be typical and they said, uh, the, to, a, to a survey called, what does home mean for you? This is what one person said. On the whole, what I want from home is privacy, being able to choose my own company, quietness, and my own things around me. So mass observation concluded on the basis of this um, that home is a place of peace and rest, a place where one can be oneself, where one belongs by right, and where one can be free and alone. So this desire, although it was expressed often in connection with a wish, quote, to have a front door of one's own, was shown by mass observation to be a matter of emotional as much as a physical space. The feeling of privacy was maintained not only by bricks and mortar, but also, more importantly, by the sensory separateness which one could attain at home. So quietness featured prominently in people's definition of home in mass observation surveys. Here's another quote from a respondent. Home means somewhere you can get away from the outside world and enjoy books, music, intimacy, privacy, and quiet. Another said, home means leisure, quiet, privacy, and forgetfulness of muddle, hurry and noise and squalor and discomfort, anxiety and worry. What I want to argue finally, however, is that there was in fact a significant disjuncture between the concerns of planners on the one hand and those of working class home dwellers on the other about what is meant, what was meant by the concept of noise. I want to say that planners had one conception of noise, home dwellers, particularly working class people who were being convinced to move into flats had another. Mass observation reports indicate that the word noise was more often used by working class communities to refer to sounds which were perceived by the hearer to emanate from a social other rather than from the mechanical sounds which so exercise the anti-noise league. Such accounts were particularly common in the responses of those working class people who had moved to new blocks of council flats, that's flats provided by the government. Mass observation explained that working class flat dwellers often objected to the way in which all sorts of people were housed together in one block. One respondent, for example, complained that you'll find the railway people are quite different from the others. We stick together and like to keep ourselves quiet, but these others, they're always popping in and out and their children the same. The noise they make is awful. You can't alter them. They'll never be altered now. That's the end of the quote. Another said, the people in the flats above me, 
and next door, the language was awful, and the noise. They was a rough lot, those, end, count, uh, end quote. So quietness in these accounts does not equate to an absolute absence of silence, what was being promoted by the Anti-Noise League. It doesn't equate to the intrusion of mechanical sounds from outside of the home, but rather, I think, it equates to shared codes of sonic respectability among those working-class communities. Yet the government domestic acoustic research undertaken in the 1930s was done on the basis that maximum attainable quietness should be striven for in home building practice. Essentially, I want to say, the emphasis placed by the Anti-Noise League and its followers in government acoustics research on technology as a source of noise and on attaining absolute quiet at home did not in the end do justice to the way in which working class people thought of sound as a matter of community cohesion. Despite the existence uh, of reports such as those undertaken by mass observation, my conclusion is that not enough attention was paid to this human, cultural dimension to sonic planning. And I think if it had been, we might be in a better situation than we are today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will have a, a, a short question time. Uh, do, do you think that this, um, this rift be between the classes and the view on, on noise is this something that's still in play today? Um, I, th I think it could well be. I think um, obviously one key issue about noise is uh, it's, it's much easier to avoid noise if you can f afford a home that's away from sources of noise, airport noise, traffic noise. So I think there's, a certain, there's certainly a spatial politics to who can afford to live where, but it's to do with economic class, but also cultural class. And I think we should maybe pay more attention to the different ways in which people understand their sonic environments. And what do we need to, to be able to pay attention to? What, what kind of knowledge do we need about people in our society to be able to act? I think mass observation shows the way forward, actually. Yeah. Um, that perhaps not enough attention was paid to this. So I, what I would say is that uh, listening is important, yeah. but not just acoustical listening, but human listening. Listening to what people have to say about how they listen to sound, because I suppose one of the points of my talk has been that, is that sound is not just a a scientific force, but something that people make meaning out of as, as cultural and social actors, mm. that we need to listen to their, to, to people's way of interpreting sound from yeah. a cultural point of view. And map mass observation was actually people going out, listening, gathering, gathering information. It like was. Like, like 500 secret agents. That's right, there uh, were secret agents out on the streets. In, in the society. Doing interviews, doing surveys, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Any questions from, from the audience? Motion och konferens. Okay, thanks for an interesting talk. I, I was just, I just sat thinking. You were saying, yeah, you need to do the observation. Uh, that is that all? Because if you're thinking, uh, also the talks we had before, you're sort of wondering why do we keep building open office spaces? Uh, because there are any number of studies saying that this is actually really bad and still we keep building them. So there must be something else in play. I mean, it's not just enough to do the studies. Sure, I think one way of answering that is it's a question of money and that was, that was uh, a concern at the time is that the government and planning agencies were coming up with ideal plans but whether or not they were actually ever put into practice is, a, is another question. And I think what's interesting about this particular moment in history is that authorities uh, were willing to um, do research uh, in a way that perhaps we don't have those capabilities as much anymore. Uh, so it's a question of what sorts of resources are available for building good homes. Are homes a matter of creating good places for people or economic units for um, accumulation of wealth? And th those two things are often in, in, in conflict when you're thinking about questions to do with acoustics and other things, of course. More questions? Do you think uh, the government took these issues more serious when, when the issues were new? Because they, they were new at, at that time. They were. I think that's a, a, it's a big part of it. Um, th there's a big drive in, in Britain. It's called the, the idea of creating the new Jerusalem. They want to create new, new communities. 
And I think because there had been so much agitation from organizations like the Anti-Noise League, because there's been so much panic, social and cultural panic about sound created by motor traffic, new technologies, it is a, it's, a, it's a moment of cultural fear about new technology. I think that's possibly the reason that so much emphasis was put on it. Um, that, despite the fact that the medical evidence was never fully accepted by government authority, yeah. the, the argument put forward that noise causes physical illness was never fully proven in, in medical science at that particular moment in history. So it's interesting that it was taken on by planning acoustics uh, and architecture anyway. Be there was a general acceptance that noise is bad, even if you can't prove the medical effects that are taking yeah. place. And, and the noise abatement organizations at that time uh, some got, got very good results and, and, and well, people were listening to, to their views. Can today's noise abatement organizations learn something from, from uh, those days, do you think? Absolutely, and not just noise abatement organizations. I think there's all sorts of lessons you can, you can take from organizations like the Anti-Noise League. As I said, there's still uh, an, an equivalent organization today. Yeah. Uh, I think the key question is how you build public consensus, how you build enough interest, because often the problem with noise is that it affects individual people in their particular situations. So making a connection between one person annoyed in their home because they have a noisy neighbor to a wider set of issues about how do we as a, as a society deal with questions to do with our soundscapes, perhaps that's the biggest challenge of, of, of making it not about the specific but about um, the, the wider cultural issues at stake. Thank you. James Mansell, thank you very thank much. You.